you so much, Victoria. Thank uh, Jeff and Rod for sticking it out, my gosh. Uh, and thank all of you for uh, making it. Uh, thank me for uh, making it, because because uh, I, uh, I flew in from Paris. Um, long story. I was on a Fulbright. I was actually doing a sabbatical. It's been canceled because the university's been closed. So anyway, here I am. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about something a little bit different, but not totally. Uh, and uh, as you know, I believe in the science, and I always talk about correlation and causation. Well, today I'm going to talk about uh, correlation and also a plausibility argument, and this is the first venue that I've presented this argument, so I'm actually going to be interested in your feedback as to whether or not you think this makes sense. So be uh, cognizant of the fact that you're guinea pigs to some extent, but it's a friendly audience. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't like it, there, I'm sure there are a lot of eggs in the room so because it is low carb. So, you know, hold them to yourself. Okay, no, we can. Um, so, first of all, I do have these disclosures. I did write these two books for the general public, uh, and I am also the chief science officer of a nonprofit in uh, San Francisco called Eat Real, because we believe in real food. Uh, we are bringing real food to schools. We have gotten rid of 270,000 pounds of sugar from the Mount Diablo Unified School District in one year. 10 pounds of sugar per year, per, per, per child per year. And we can do that for your school district too, and we'll need to, uh, and you'll see why. Uh, in addition, I have another disclosure, and that is that I am not really specifically, exclusively low carb. I support low carb. I use low carb in my practice for the right patient. But I also used low fat when necessary for the right patient. Okay, and the point is knowing who those patients are. And that takes a little bit of science and artwork and a little medicine. So let's jump in. We're talking about sugar today and cancer. So first of all, everybody thinks it's about obesity. Well, there's no question that obesity is a risk factor for cancer. And it's about a hazard risk ratio of about 1.5. So about 50% increased risk of developing cancer. And these are different studies that look at that. But when you look at the specific cancers that seem to be associated with obesity, prostate, colon, lymphoma, esophagus, stomach, liver, pancreas, kidney, leukemia, they are endodermal origin. They are not of mesodermal or ectodermal origin. So they are not uh, bone, they are not muscle, they are not fat cancers. And from ectodermal, they're not uh, uh, skin, and they are not CNS. They're endodermal cancers, and that actually suggests that there's some specific pathway involved. If you look at the International Agency for Research on Cancer, here's the list, and again, it uh, holds up based on uh, uh, international data that these cancers are specifically related to obesity. Now, the question is why? Well, obesity could predispose to cancer for several reasons. One, adipose tissue could be a storehouse for toxins because most of them are um, nonpolar. Um, um, for instance, benzene and uh, other uh, 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 specific uh, uh, carcinogens, like for instance, things that you find in meat uh, after you've grilled it uh, in terms of methylcyanins, et cetera. Could be due to increased estrogen synthesis because adipose tissue has aromatase, so there's an increased estrogen load could be due to oxidative stress and reactive oxygen species, due to metabolic syndrome, as we'll talk about. Or it could be due to hyperinsulinemia, as uh, uh, Jeff talked about, or IGF-1, which is higher in, ca in cancer, and uh, specifically free IGF-1, and lower IGF binding protein-1, which is insulin regulated negatively. So the higher the insulin, the lower the IGF-BP-1, the higher the free IGF-1, and the greater risk for cancer, because after all, these are all growth factors. Okay, knowing that, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, this is what they put out in 2014. They said, yeah, we know that there's a relationship between obesity and cancer, so we need education and awareness, clinical guidance, tools and resources, research promotion, policy and advocacy, oh yeah, yeah, sure, sure, blah, 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 yada, 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 and weight management in cancer survivors. That's it, that's what they said. Okay, so first of all, how well you think that works? Second of all, don't we need weight management in everybody to prevent the cancer, just the survivors? I mean, like, how dumb is this? But that's where we are. 
So they would say to you, well, obesity is the problem. I'm not so sure that that's true. And here's three reasons why. Number one, here is a scattergram of all of the countries in the world, obesity prevalence on the x-axis, diabetes prevalence on the y-axis. And you would look at this scattergram and you would say, well, very clearly, Dr. Lustig, there is a correlation, and here it is, and there is, I, I don't argue that. But you know, correlation is not the same thing as concordance because there are countries that are obese without being diabetic, such as Iceland, Mongolia, Micronesia, and there are countries that are diabetic without being obese, such as India, Pakistan, and China. India and China today have an 11% diabetes rate, and they're not fat. We are the fattest nation on earth, and we have a 9.4% diabetes rate. If obesity is the cause of diabetes, if the obesity is the cause of metabolic syndrome, if obesity is the cause of cancer, then uh, how do you explain that? Well, the fact is you can't because it's not true. In addition, problem number two, obesity is increasing worldwide at the rate of 2.78% per year amortized over the last 40 years. Yet, diabetes is increasing worldwide at the rate of 4.07% per year amortized for the same period of time. If diabetes is just a subset of the larger group of obese individuals, then how come it's going up faster? Problem number two. Problem number three. Here are the secular trends in diabetes rates. Again, diabetes being the sentinel disease of metabolic syndrome in the entire United States. And on the left side, you can see the total uh, numbers in the black. On the right, we have them uh, stratified by weight category. Obese at top, and you can see there's been a 25% increase in incidence per year amongst the obese, true. But there's also been a 25% increase in the normal weight population as well. If diabetes is just a manifestation of obesity, then how come the normal weight people are getting diabetes just as fast? Problem number three. So here's the most important thing, and many of you have seen this uh, set of slides before, but it's the most important thing to explain, and Jeff actually had several slides to this point as well. This is a Venn diagram of the entire United States population. 240 million, 30% obese, BMI over 30, 70% normal weight, BMI under 30. Now, the standard mantra from the doctors and the dietitians and the Institute of Medicine and the Surgeon General and the National Institutes of Health and the White House and Congress and the food industry is the following. 80% of those obese individuals, 80% of those 30%, those 57 million people, they're sick. They're fat and they're sick. And they're sick because they're fat. And if they would only just diet and exercise, we'd solve this problem. That's what they say. Garbage. Total complete trash. Anybody know why? It's on the slide. Well, it is true, and Jeff mentioned it in his talk, it is true that 80% of 30% are metabolically ill. I don't argue that, that is absolutely true. But that means 20% of 30% are not. They are metabolically healthy. We have a name for them, MHO, metabolically healthy obese. They will live a completely normal life, die at a completely normal age, not cost the taxpayer a dime. They even have normal length telomeres the ends of the chromosomes that determine how fast your cell dies and that determines how fast you die. They are not bothering anybody, they're just fat. Conversely, and this is the important part, 40% of the normal weight population have the exact same diseases as do the obese. Normal weight people get type 2 diabetes, hypertension, lipid problems, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and dementia too. They get it at a lower weight, True, but if they get it, how can it be about behavior? This actually looks more like exposure. This more, looks more like what influenza does or cholera, or for that matter, coronavirus. Okay? So this can't be about behavior. This is about some exposure that everyone, including the normal weight people, are exposed to. And if you do the math, turns out there are more thin sick people 67 million, then there are fat sick people, 57 million, but the thin sick people are calling the fat sick people the problem. <laughs> and when you do the math on all of them, that's more than half the US population. 
And I guarantee you, no matter how bad coronavirus gets, it will not be half the U.S. population. So this is a bigger problem even than coronavirus, but that is now a national emergency. This is not. Figure. And I can prove it to you, and Jeff mentioned it as well. Okay, so here are two equally weighted people, okay? CT scans through the abdomen of two equally weighted people. One's healthy, one's sick. Which one's sick, A or B? B. B is sick because A, he's got metabolically healthy obesity. He's got big love handles. He's got subcutaneous or big butt fat. B, he's got fat all around his organs. He's got intra-abdominal fat. He's got visceral fat. He's got big belly fat. And we have a name for this. It's called, as Jeff said, TOFI, T-O-F-I, thin on the outside, fat on the inside, real medical term, 1,500 midline citations, go look it up. So my question to you, sitting here right now, are you a TOFI? How would you know? How could you know? Does your doctor know? If your doctor knows, how come the doctor's not telling you? And if your doctor did know, what would they do about it anyway? These are the issues. The fact of the matter is, you guys are using low carb for those people, which is a good idea. And I'm not against it. I'm for it. And I'm supportive of it. Okay, but I think that that may be not necessary for some of the patients. I think that we can do something a little less extreme and help just as many people. So that's the issue. So what I'm arguing is obesity is not the problem. Obesity is a marker for the problem. Metabolic syndrome is the problem. That's where the money goes, 75% of all healthcare dollars. And here are the diseases. Diabetes is the sentinel disease, but cancer is on the list. And I will show you how and why. So if it's not calories and it's not obesity, then it's, I guess, the type of calories. And as you've heard already, all calories are not the same. So if you look at this monograph that came out from um, uh, ASCO many years ago, we know that dietary components do have some relevance to cancer uh, promotion. Um, dietary fat can increase colon, mammary, pancreatic cancer. Dietary protein can increase colon and mammary cancer. Dietary starch can increase ovarian and prostate cancer. And dietary fiber will prevent colon cancer. And I would argue with Michael Eads, and I already did, that fiber does have a value. He said there, it had no value. I would argue it has a very real value. It is not food for you. It is food for your bacteria. It is food for your microbiome. And if you don't feed your microbiome, guess what? Your microbiome will feed on you, which is not so good. And I am actually writing a whole book about this whole issue right now. We can talk about it at the Q&A if you want. So the ASCO position doesn't even mention dietary composition. It just mentioned weight loss, even though they put this monograph out. Well, turns out it depends on what the food is, as you can imagine. So ultra-processed food is now more than half of the UK diet, it is 62% of the American diet, ultra-processed food. Okay, that is food that has basically been stripped of its matrix and conglomerated into new shapes and sizes. And if you look at what is ultra-processed food, okay, in the lower left, pretty much three-quarters of it is sugar. That's what, that is the marker for ultra-processed food. And the reason is because if you didn't put sugar in it, it would taste like shit. It is the marker for processed food because that's the only way they can get you to eat it because sugar is addictive. So if they could put cocaine in the food, they would, but they can't, so they do this instead. And you can see that in terms of the quartiles of ultra-processed food consumption, the highest quartile has the most significant increase in cancer rates. And every 10% increase in processed food increases your cancer risk by 12%. So here's what our sugar consumption has done over the last 200 years. Our ancestors getting fruits and vegetables out of the ground with the occasional honey consumed about four pounds of sugar per year. Fine, no problem, easy. With the advent of the pot still and distillation and crystallization and CNH and Domino and Texas and Hawaii and Louisiana, we increased our sugar production and our sugar consumption till we stabilized when price equal demand before World War II. There's the rationing of World War II, came up to the same level. And then of course, we had many things happen in the 60s. We had 
the high fructose corn syrup enter our world, we had the dietary guidelines, and we had Hurricane Allen, which destroyed the sugar crop, and so high fructose corn syrup came in to take its place because it was a natural product, okay? So all these things happen, you know, basically substituted sugar for fat, as you've all heard a zillion times, okay? So we have increased our consumption of sugar by 25-fold, not four pounds per year, 100 pounds per year, and it is that change Okay, that people don't talk about. Here's everyone talking about 40% fat and 30% carbohydrate and all that. Okay, just look at the sugar, okay? It's insane. So what are we talking about? We're talking about two molecules, glucose and fructose. So on top is high fructose corn syrup, on bottom is sucrose, table sugar, cane sugar, beet sugar, the stuff you put in your coffee. Glucose is a six-membered ring, notice, six-membered. Fructose is a five-membered ring. They are not the same. They're not handled the same by the body. And I will show you how in a moment. Now, sucrose, you'll notice, six-membered ring, five-membered ring, O-glycosidic linkage linking the two. The enzyme sucrase in your intestine cleaves this in a nanosecond. You absorb the two moieties separately, but ultimately, what ends up in your portal vein, which hits your liver, exactly the same. So it doesn't matter whether it's high fructose corn syrup or sucrose. And the data say that high fructose corn syrup and sucrose are virtually identical. Yeah, they're virtually identically bad. They're equally dangerous. They're equally toxic. And I use that word very specifically because it is not dependent on calories or obesity. And we have causation. So I'm very comfortable with the word toxicity. Toxic. And it is the fructose moiety that is specifically toxic. So is sugar public enemy number one? Trans fats used to be, but we know that, and they're coming out of the diet. So sugar now is the one that the food industry adds specifically to get you to buy more. So yes, it is public enemy number one. So let's talk about sugar and disease. Start with obesity. Now, the food industry will tell you that yeah, sugar causes obesity, but it's not very, very significant. In fact, the data suggest only 10% of weight gain is related to sugar. And that's seen on this slide. BMI of about 0.8 BMI points. You see the uh, diamond, it's past the uh, identity line, so it's significant, but it's only 10%. You know, there are things that are much worse in terms of weight gain. And that's true, actually. There are things that are worse in terms of weight gain, but they tell you that sugar's not related to obesity because of this. They also throw this out, and this has got to be debunked, and I'm doing it right now. So if you look at this slide, you'll notice from 2000 to 2020, we, our sugar consumption's actually gone down, which is true. It's gone down by about 10% because of the obesity epidemic, because people are trying to cut back. True. So we've gone from 100 pounds down to about 90 pounds. It's true. In the meantime, obesity rates continue to escalate. So they're saying, how could it possibly be sugar? Because after all, sugar's going down, obesity is going up. And so they use this as an argument against regulation and against culpability for their product. Is this true? Well, this was a hard one to deal with until just this past year. In fact, just this past month when it finally came out, I actually reviewed this article. A group at UT Knoxville actually did a little calculus, and they actually remodeled it based on the state of Wisconsin, and you can see the data here. And they had 46 calendar years and 75 different life ages that they examined separately. And what they did was they applied a mathematical function that did not just look at today's sugar consumption, it looked at last year's sugar consumption as well. And by doing that, and you can see that on the lower left corner, how they did that, okay, they developed a new model, and the model now approximates the data almost identically. So this is a complicated function, but nonetheless a real function in terms of the cumulative effect of sugar, probably due to its effect on adipocyte uh, uh, growth and uh, adipogenesis. Now, it is true that there are other things that cause weight gain. That is true. Potato chips and french fries, numbers one and two. I don't argue that. Sugar comes in third. There's, you know, uh, sweets and desserts and sugar-sweetened beverages. You add them together, they come in third. So, yeah, there are a lot of things that cause weight gain. Sugar only being one of them. This is very interesting. This was a uh, group from UC Davis, Roberto de Vogli. And what they did was they collected the cash register receipts from 
all of the fast food restaurants in all 37 OECD developed countries for 20 years. How's that? Okay. And ask the question, does fast food consumption predict weight gain? And the answer is clearly it does. There it is right there. Okay, and this is a baseline to, you know, uh, 20 years later. So this is a predictive, a perspective correlation. So then they ask the question, okay, fast food predicts weight gain. What about fast food predicts weight gain? And so they had to model, they had to do a multivariate linear regression analysis to ask which of the components, was it the hamburger or was it the french fries or was it the soft drinks? That was the question. And it turned out it was all the soft drinks. It wasn't the hamburger, it wasn't the french fries. I actually have to tell you, I was a little surprised. Okay? And when they did all the rest of the modeling, that didn't change the effect of the soft drinks. So basically, the soft drinks are the driver of the fast food's effect on obesity. Now, the problem is that the soft drink companies don't like that. They don't want you to know that. And so they've published their own data. And so this was a um, meta-analysis that was done in 2013, where they looked at 18 separate data points and asked the question, do, do sugar beverages predict weight gain? If the uh, food industry sponsored the study, five out of six said no effect of sugar beverages on weight gain. If the studies were independently funded, 10 out of 12 said yes, effect of sugar on weight gain. So you can see that corporate sponsorship had something to do with the outcome. And this was nailed down even more by my colleague at UCSF, Dean Schillinger, in Annals of Internal Medicine, because he had 60 data points. Okay? And you can see that there were 26 that were food industry sponsored. 26 out of 26 said no effect of sugar on diabetes or obesity. Whereas of the 34 that were independently funded, 33 out of 34 said yes, effect of sugar on obesity or diabetes. So bottom line, the, the literature is polluted. It's polluted and it's polluted on purpose. Because then they can go back and say, see, it's inconclusive, which is what they've been doing for the last 50 years. Okay, sugar and diabetes. Forget sugar and weight gain. Sugar and diabetes, let's talk about the real disease. Let's talk about metabolic syndrome. So I'm gonna to present to you plausibility, mechanism, correlation, and causational studies. So this is what you learned in med school. You get fat. The fat cell is the problem. You get fat, and because you get fat, the fat drives cytokines, TNF-alpha, IL-6, which go via the portal vein to the liver. The liver responds to those by becoming insulin resistant, increasing hepatic glucose output, HGO, which thereby increases blood sugar, which thereby causes the islet cells to have to make more insulin, which then drives more energy into fat. And so you end up with this vicious cycle, but it starts with the fat. It's the adipocentric view of metabolic syndrome and then the muscles along for the ride. This is what they teach in medical school. The question is, is it true? Yes or no? We'll talk about it. So what I'm gonna to say to you is, it is true for about 10% of the population. For about 50% of the population, there's a different explanation, which has been buried. And I'm gonna explain that one to you a little bit differently. It starts with the liver, not with the fat, okay? Because the liver gets insulin resistant, and how? So on the left, we have normal liver, sinusoids, myelocanaliculi, kupfer cells, all good. And on the right, we have fatty liver disease. And you can see the fat vacuoles, you can see the macrophages, you can see the beginning of scarring and fibrosis. The question is, what caused it? Prior to 1980, if you saw this under the microscope, Bingo, it's alcohol. But now, five-year-olds get this, and they don't drink alcohol. Turns out, sugar does the exact same thing, and the reason is because sugar and alcohol are handled by the liver virtually identically. That's why kids are getting the diseases of alcohol without alcohol. 
because fructose and ethanol are handled by the liver virtually identically. And it makes sense that that would be the case because after all, where do you get alcohol from? Fermentation of sugar, it's called wine. We do it in Napa and Sonoma every day, not during coronavirus, but otherwise, yeah, all the time. All right? So the big difference between fructose and alcohol is that for, fructose, that for alcohol, the yeast does the glycolysis, the first step. For, for fructose, uh, we do our own first step, but after that, the mitochondria of the liver have to handle it virtually the same way. And this is mitochondrial overload from whatever the substrate is that caused the overload. Could also be branched chain amino acids, by the way, from corn-fed beef also causes this. So all you low carbers, keep that in mind. So here is a fat fraction map from an MHO, metabolically healthy obese. Notice the love handles on the sides, okay? But take a look at this guy's liver, dark. 2.6% fat. This is MHO, this guy will outlive you. Now take a look at this guy in the center. This is more like what you'd see, okay? Notice obesity, but take a look at this guy's liver, 24% liver fat. This guy's got non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This guy's got metabolic syndrome. Now take a look at this guy. Is he fat? No love handles. But take a look at his liver, 23% liver fat. This guy is thin, but he's got the same diseases as the guy in the center. Thin sick, fat sick, fat healthy. So you cannot tell from the outside what's going on on the inside because it's the fat you can't see that makes the difference. And the fat you can't see is in your liver and how did it get there? That's the point. And it didn't get there from the grass-fed beef, but it could have gotten there from the corn-fed beef, but it most assuredly got there from the sugar. NAFLD is the liver manifestation of metabolic syndrome, and it correlates with all the other manifestations of metabolic syndrome. So large waste, high glucose, low HDL, high triglycerides, high blood pressure, all the things you've heard about, in both adults on top and in children on the bottom. Fatty liver disease is liver metabolic syndrome. It is 45% of Latinos, and that's one of the reasons why Latinos are so predisposed to getting diabetes, because they have, get fatty liver faster, because they have two polymorphisms that drive liver fat faster than it does in Caucasians. African Americans, however, are protected from fatty liver disease. They are much more likely to export the uh, fat out of their liver to take up residence in the peripheral adipose tissue, which is why they increase their sub-Q fat. So that's why they have more obesity, why they have a higher BMI before they get sick. Now, about one out of 20 people with liver fat will go on to develop steatohepatitis, that is fatty liver plus inflammation. And of those, 25% will develop cirrhosis and will die of their disease if they don't get a liver transplant. Now, this is probably the other most important slide I'm going to show you. So the question is, which fat causes the disease? We all assumed it was just how fat you were. No. Then we assumed, okay, it's all the belly fat, the visceral fat. This was the first study that said, no, it's the liver fat. So this was work from Sam Klein's group at uh, Wash U St. Louis. And what they did was they, when they had finally got a three Tesla scanner, because you need a big scanner to be able to look at liver fat, and it took a while. Um, what they did was they put a whole bunch of fat people in a scanner and they measured visceral fat versus liver fat. And what they showed in this study was that when they held the liver fat constant, the visceral fat explained none of the effect on insulin uh, resistance. Whereas when they held the visceral fat constant, the liver fat explained all of the difference in insulin resistance. It's the liver fat that makes the difference, not the visceral, not the subcutaneous. It's the liver fat. And 45% of adults in the United States now have fatty liver disease. You want to talk about epidemics? That's the epidemic. Okay, I guarantee you coronavirus will not reach 45%. Now the question is, where'd that fat come from? that liver fat. And that's in the right picture. And you'll notice in the gray, non-systemic fatty acids. Non 
systemic. Now, we know where systemic fatty acids come from. They come from adipose tissue lipolysis or from diet, but this is non-systemic. Where do those come from? The fat made right in the liver through a process called de novo lipogenesis, DNL, new fat making. This is what your liver does to sugar to get it out of the liver. It turns it into fat and then exports it out in VLDL, which we measure in the serum triglyceride. Okay, so here's how the liver handles glucose. Glucose comes in, and first of all, only 20% of a glucose bolus actually hits the liver because the other 80% is metabolized by the rest of the body. And pretty much all the glucose ends up as glycogen. Liver starch, non-toxic, non-dangerous. It's what your liver wants to do with excess glucose. That's why marathoners carb load is to increase their hepatic glycogen stores. Okay, now, can glucose get turned into fat in the liver? Yeah, but you gotta really work at it. Okay, so you, you know, there's not gonna be very much pyruvate reaching the mitochondria, and so there's, you know, the, it's regulated because insulin's gonna keep the pyruvate at the right level for the mitochondrial uh, 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 tricarboxylic acid, Vmax. So you're not gonna end up overwhelming your mitochondria with glucose, okay? You might end up gaining weight with glucose, but you're not gonna overwhelm your mitochondria with glucose. Right? Now, a little bit of it might end up as citrate, and then the citrate will get thrown off via the citrate shuttle, exit the mitochondria, and then that citrate will act as the substrate for these three enzymes that you can see there, ACL, ATP citrate lyase, ACC, acetyl-CoA carboxylase 1, and FAS, fatty acid synthase. And those build citrate into fatty acyl-CoA, fatty acids, which then get hooked onto uh, 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 a, triglycer uh, a, a glycerol uh, backbone to form a triglyceride, which then get packaged with ApoB, with phosphatidylcholine, and then get exported out as VLDL. And that's what you measure in your serum triglyceride. Everybody see how that works? Got it? So for any molecule of glucose, how much of it's gonna end up as fat? Not very much. But here's fructose. Now fructose is a whole nother story because only the liver can metabolize fructose. So 100% of the fructose load ends up at the liver. And do you see glycogen anywhere? No glycogen, doesn't go to glycogen. It goes straight down to the mitochondria. The mitochondria end up with a huge pyruvate load, can't deal, deal with the whole thing, and so it sends out a whole bunch of citrate, which then ends up being built up into fatty acyl coas. Now, some of that will get exported out as triglyceride, and that's why you have the hypertriglyceridemia of sugar consumption. But some of it won't make it out. Some of it will stay in the liver, will stick in the liver, and now you've got a lipid droplet, now you've got fatty liver disease. And once you have fatty liver disease, now you have insulin resistance at the level of the liver. So fructose, and it's not insulin regulated. So basically, when you hit your intestine, with a 20 ounce Coke, you have basically generated a tsunami of sugar that your liver can't handle. And your liver has no choice but to take that whole tsunami and turn it into fat. Some of it will go out and be a risk factor for heart disease and obesity, and some of it will stick and be a risk factor for fatty liver disease and diabetes. So I guess you can choose which one you wanna die of but that's, where the, that's the driver of the phenomenon. And we've proven that by doing a study where we basically took 43 kids from our own UCSF pediatric obesity clinic with metabolic syndrome, African-American and Latino, all high sugar consumers, and what we did was we figured out what they were eating on their home diet, we studied them on their home diet, and then for the next nine days, we catered their meals. No added sugar. We took their percent consumption of sugar from 28% of calories to 10% of calories. Everybody got that? 28% down to 10%. So that's a loss of about 350 to 400 calories per day as sugar. Now, if you do that for 10 days, nine days, you're gonna lose some weight. We didn't want them to lose weight because if they lost weight and they got better, people would say, well, of course they got better, they lost weight. We wanted them to stay the same weight. So we had to replace what we took out with something else. 
we gave them refined starch. Got it? So, in the vernacular, we took the pastries out, we put the bagels in. We took the sweetened yogurt out, we put the baked potato chips in. We took the chicken teriyaki out, we put the turkey hot dogs in, okay? So we didn't give them good food, we gave them crappy food. We gave them processed food, we gave them kid food. We gave them food kids would eat, we bought it at Safeway. Okay, but it was no added sugar food. It was high starch, low sugar food. And we gave them a scale. And every day, we'd call them up on the phone, say, what'd you weigh? And if they were losing weight, eat more! In order to keep them weight constant over the course of the 10 days. And then we studied them again. And we published these three papers, and actually a fourth, and we're about to, we're writing the fifth and the sixth now on the study. So this is just describing what I just told you. All of their labs got better. Their fasting glucose went down five points. Their blood pressure went down five points. Their fasting lactate, and that's really important. They had a lactate level at baseline. You're not supposed to have a lactate level at baseline. If you have a lactate level, where's Mark? If you have a lactate level at baseline, that means you're either post-exercise, or you have cancer, or you have a mitochondrial encephalomyopathy. These kids had a lactate level, and it went down just by switching starch for sugar. Their fasting insulin went down 25%. Their glucose area into the curve went down 8%. Their insulin area into the curve went down 25%. Their triglycerides went down 46%. Every aspect of their metabolic health improved with no change in calories and no change in weight. We reversed their metabolic syndrome, and I will show it to you. So here's their oral glucose tolerance test before and after. On the left is the glucose, down 8%. And there's the insulin curve, the craft curve, if you will. And you'll notice that before, it wasn't coming down because they were insulin resistant. And even though they were getting more glucose, they actually had a more sensitive insulin curve. Their insulin area into the curve went down 25%, and they started clearing the insulin because their liver was working better. So we wanted to see whether or not their liver was turning that sugar into fat. So what we did was we gave them C13 labeled acetate, which got incorporated into new palmitate, which we could then measure in the VLDL. And here's what their de novo lipogenesis did. It got cut in half. So they're making less fat in their liver, even though they're getting just as many calories and more glucose. Now, what happened to their fat stores? Now, remember, they didn't lose weight, kept the same weight. So their subcutaneous fat did not change at all. But take a look at their visceral fat, went down 7%. But take a look at their liver fat, went down 22%. 22% with no change in calories and no change in weight. And as it turns out, their change in liver fat predicted their change in insulin sensitivity. And now we actually have data that showed that they had non-alcoholic fatty pancreas disease too. And that got better when we took the sugar out of their diet. So in cartoon form, Fatty liver with lots of triglyceride, lots of VLDL, lots of liver fat. Nine days of isocaloric fructose restriction. The liver fat went down, the de novo lipogenesis went down, the VLDL went down, and the insulin sensitivity and insulin secretion improved. In other words, we reversed their metabolic syndrome with no change in calories, no change in weight. QED, proof positive, F you. So, we think that the adipocentric ver version of metabolic syndrome is actually the problem. It can happen, yes, but you have to get really fat to have that happen. What more likely happens is your liver gets insulin resistant because of the sugar bolus that now all of us are exposed to from processed food, which drives fatty liver, which then drives hepatic glucose output, which then drives the beta cell to make extra insulin, which then drives increased adipogenesis at the level of the fat cell. This is the hepatocentric view of metabolic syndrome. And then the muscles along for the ride. But that's not all. You think that's all? Nah, there's more. Reactive oxygen species. We know this is very important for metabolic syndrome. So here are five pictures of food. They all share one thing in common. What is it? They're all brown, thank you. 
This is called the Browning reaction or the Maillard reaction. It's the reason for hemoglobin A1C. It's the non-enzymatic glycation of proteins. So here's how you should think about it. You can slow roast your meat at 375 degrees for an hour, or you can slow roast your meat at 98.6 degrees for 75 years. The answer is the same. You're browning. You're just all browning. You're browning right now. As we speak, it's part of life. Okay? Death is part of life. This is what kills you. Okay? It's just a question of how fast. And if you don't believe me, here's newborn rib cartilage in the upper left, nice and white, and there's 88-year-old rib cartilage, nice and brown. Okay? You're browning. And if you had orange juice this morning, you're browning seven times faster. But I already know you didn't because this is the low-carb conference. Okay. <laughs> so why does this happen? Because the aldehyde moiety of the linear form of glucose binds to epsilon amino groups of lysine on the hemoglobin molecule, which forms a shift base and then spontaneously decomposes to form this amid linkage, and that basically stays for three months, and that's why you can measure hemoglobin A1C. And every time this reaction occurs, you throw off an ROS, a reactive oxygen species, an oxygen radical, oxidative stress, which has to be quenched by an antioxidant. In the liver, that would be glutathione or vitamin E. In other organs, they have other antioxidants, but primarily we're talking about liver here. Okay, everybody with me? And it doesn't matter if it's glucose or fructose. But it turns out, glucose doesn't do this very fast. It does it, but it doesn't do it very fast. Okay? And the reason is because of that ring form. Remember that six-membered ring? Well, there it is on top. So there's the linear form of glucose, the ring form, there's the space-occupying model. Notice, six-membered ring, hydroxymethyl group sticking up, not bothering anybody. This is a happy compound. At pH, uh, pH 7.4, 37 degrees, only 0.8% of the glucose in your body is in the linear form where it can bind to proteins. But now take a look at fructose below. Linear form, ring form, space occupying model. Five membered ring, tighter wound, easier to break apart, called ionic strain. Two hydroxymethyl groups, axially, Button heads called allosteric interaction, basically driving them apart. So at pH 37 degree, pH 7.4, 37 degrees, three percent of the fructose will be in the linear form, and that reactive keto group is just as reactive as the reactive aldehyde group. So more fructose, more oxygen radicals. And we can show that, and you can do the study at home if you want. Take two test tubes. Fill them with albumin, bovine sodium albumin in, in water. Okay, Ca uh, add equal amounts of glucose or fructose to each. Cap them with parafilm, put them in the sunlight. And each day you come back and stick it in your home spectrophotometer. And this is how fast the reaction occurs. You see for glucose, you see for fructose. Seven times faster, 100 times the number of oxygen radicals. Well, you have to do something with those. You have to quench them. You have to make them, you know, basically die. And that's what the peroxisomes do. And that's why people use TZDs for metabolic syndrome is because that increases the number of peroxisomes. And we know because if the more, greater the fructose consumption, the greater the steatitosis or fibrosis. So this is basically what we're saying, is fructose enters the liver cell, can, can ca cause the Maillard reaction, which will then generate reactive oxygen species. The mitochondria will generate reactive oxygen species. In addition, of course, the cytokines that come from the peripheral fat will also generate reactive oxygen species. So you have this ROS pool sitting in the liver that has to be quenched. And they go to the peroxisome to die, unless the peroxisome doesn't have enough antioxidants, in which case then the ROSs can damage the liver cell. It can cause lipid peroxidation, cause protein denaturation, can cause what we call ER stress, endoplasmic reticulum stress. You may have heard that term. Okay? And what that means is you will end up not being able to fold your insulin molecule or being able to fold your insulin receptor molecule, known as the unfolded protein response. So now you've got cellular metabolic dysfunction and potentially cell death. That is metabolic syndrome. Okay. I've got one minute and 13 seconds to tell you about cancer. <laughs> 
So I'm going to talk about plausibility, mechanisms, and correlation. No causation yet, and that's the issue. So you've probably heard that cancer is a metabolic disease because different things affect its ability to progress. And all of those things are related to metabolic syndrome. So the question is the plausibility. How does sugar make this happen? So who here has ever heard of Otto Warburg? Good, the Warburg effect. He was the person who figured out that cancer cells do not need oxygen to grow. He won the Nobel Prize in 1931. So can anybody else think of a cell that doesn't need oxygen to grow? How about a fetus? The oxygen tension in a fetus, the PO2 is 30. So how does, the, how does the fetus grow? It grows faster. Turns out, actually, that the more oxygen, the less growth. The less oxygen, the more growth. This makes absolutely no sense, except it does. And this is the key. So differentiated tissue have mitochondria. Cancer cells don't. Anaerobes grow, but they don't have mitochondria either. In fact, mitochondria burn energy all the way to carbon dioxide. But cancer cells and fetal cells and anaerobes, they need the glucose, they need the carbon backbone of glucose for other stuff. If they burn it all the way to carbon dioxide, guess what? No other stuff. They need it for ribose, for DNA. They need it for lipids, for membranes. They need it for amino acids to build their cells. That's how cells grow. So you can either burn or you can grow. You can't do both. And at any given point in a cell's life, they will have to do either one or the other, never both at the same time. And that's important for you to understand. There is a growth paradigm. There is a burning paradigm. Okay? We're going to talk about in a minute what those are and what causes that. So when a cell is doing the right thing, nutrient transporters bring stuff in, and the glycolysis occurs, you get two pyruvates, you get two NADHs and two ATPs. So you don't get a whole lot of uh, ATP out of, pyruvate, uh, out of uh, glucose from the glycolysis. But the pyruvate will enter the TCA cycle, throw off a lot of NADH, which will then, of course, um, uh, 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 act uh, as an uh, oxidative uh, uh, reaction later. And you get 30 ATP out of the um, uh, TCA cycle burning of um, of pyruvate, okay? And you will make a little bit of lactate, not very much, and that will recycle. And fat will come in and will also end up as acetyl-CoA through that process I just showed you, and it will throw off 108 ATP. So when your cell is in burning mode, you can generate a whole lot of ATP from glucose or from fat. And protein, same thing. But when you have a cancer cell, you do not have mitochondria. The mitochondria can't keep up with the cell division. In addition, because the cell's growing so fast, it outgrows this, the blood supply. So there are a lot of cells in cancers that can't be fed with oxygen. So they are growing without oxygen. The question is, if you're only getting two ATP out of glycolysis, because that's all you can do without oxygen, how can they do that? How can they stay alive? And the answer is because they're putting in 400 times more. Because they have opened up the floodgates so that that cancer cell is now being flooded with glucose. That's why. So glucose is absolutely vital for cancer cell growth. To make ATP, sure, but mostly by, via glycolysis, but there's 400 times as much. But you need ribose for DNA, you need fat for membranes, the pentose phosphate shunt makes that happen. So if you burn it all the way to carbon dioxide, that's an end product, you're done. Okay, yeah, it makes a lot of ATP, but that's it. You can't grow on that. So you don't want oxygen. You don't want mitochondria in a cancer cell. So cancer cells are all about making new cells. So now you've got a whole bunch of glucose coming in, so you've got a whole bunch of pyruvate, a whole bunch of ATP. You're not going to do much in the uh, uh, mitochondria at all. You're going to generate a whole bunch of lactate. Cancer cells make lactate like crazy. The pentose phosphate chain is going to make ribose, you're going to make DNA, Okay, you're going to um, generate the novo lipogenesis. You're going to make fat out of your acetyl-CoA, like I showed you, in the uh, in, out of the mitochondria. And you're going to take glutamine, and you're going to turn that into um, uh, uh, proteins as well. Okay? So what does fructose do? Fructose enters that glycolysis. Remember, it doesn't have insulin, and it doesn't need anything, and it generates more fat and more ribose. 
Now, the question is why? Real quick, this is the hypothesis part of this. This is the cellular metabolism in cancer worked up by Luke Cantley's group at uh, Cornell. And there are three, count them, three enzymes in each cell that tell the cell what to do with the energy. And here they are. The first one is called PI3 kinase. You may have heard of it. PI3 kinase determines whether the cell opens up to let the 400 times as much glucose in. That's its job, is to open the floodgates. The next one is AMP kinase, and that's the one that tells the mitochondria, burn or not. Okay, so take that extra glucose and either burn it or don't, depending on whether it's turned on or off. And then the last one, which is not on the slide, is called mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin. And that's the uh, enzyme that tells the cell whether to live or die. It ge generates autophagy when it's on. Okay? So we know that this is true because we know that metformin can inhibit cancer, and metformin stimulates AMP kinase because it's basically generating mitochondria. And by doing so, it's improving insulin sensitivity, and it's also increasing burning so that you don't have the, um, the tools to make extra cells. So metformin is an anti-cancer drug. It's also an anti-aging drug because it's allowing stuff to burn to completion. So here's the hypothesis. There are three enzymes. They can either be on or off, which means there are eight permutations, two to the cubed. So one is for growth, when PI3 kinase is on, AMP kinase is off, and mTOR is on, you have growth, and that's when you have cancer. When it's the opposite, when the PI3 kinase is off, the AMP kinase is on, and the mTOR is off, that's burning. These are the two, growth and burning, growth and burning. So every cell in the body has to be able to do one of these at one time in its life. But there are six other permutations, and here they are. And it turns out that whenever you have one of these other permutations, that's when you have disease. So when the PI3 kinase is on, but the others are not, now you have all this extra glucose and you don't know what to do with it. That's metabolic syndrome. When the mTOR is on and nothing else is on, then you have early aging because you can't clear cells because there's no autophagy because that's the garbage crew, autophagy. And when you don't have autophagy, you have cellular senescence. When you have, uh, the good thing about AMP kinase is it turns off mTOR. So you can actually have um, uh, uh, mTOR being on it will be turned off by AMP kinase. The point is you can have different aspects of cellular um, uh, survival and disease based on these different enzymes being set at different places. And do you know what sets those enzymes in different places? Food. No drugs, food. AMP kinase is the master regulator. I'm going to go through this really fast. Okay? It promotes all the burning things, which are here in, gr in green, and it stops all the growth things, which are here in blue. And if you up the AMP kinase, you can't even get liver fat because your liver's burning like crazy. You can't even store it. It is exquisitely sensitive to AMP. That's why it's called AMP kinase, because AMP fits into the active site, and AMP goes into that active site and basically turns on that because it says we need more mitochondria because AMP says that so much ATP has been basically used up, okay? Well, that active site has three arginines and fructose gets converted to a meta metabolite called methylglyoxal and we found this in our studies in kids. And what it does is it goes into that active site binds to those arginines through that Maillard reaction and basically inactivates the AMP kinase. And when you have an AMP kinase that's dead, guess what happens? You get growth when you shouldn't. So we know that because we measured D-lactate. D-lactate's a very specific metabolic byproduct of methylglyoxal, not L-lactate, D-lactate, different. You need a special study. And it's higher in the obese, and we saw in our children it went down by 38% just by getting rid of the fructose. So we're pretty darn sure that methylglyoxal is the business end of the fructose molecule. It is the toxic metabolite in the liver that is driving AMP kinase to do all the wrong things and none of the right things. So I'm gonna go, I'm just gonna, because of time, I'm gonna forget about that. I'm just gonna finish with correlation. 
So does sugar consumption correlate with cancer in humans? And the answer is yep, in certain ones, endodermal ones, like there, and with breast cancer as well. But fiber will make that go away. And if you look at sugar-sweetened beverages against obesity, you can see they are um, synergistic in terms of cancer risk. American Heart Association knows this, says we need to cut our sugar consumption, but we haven't. And basically, our food dollars are being spent on processed foods loaded with sugar, very specifically because the food industry knows when they add it, you buy more. And this is what we are giving cancer patients. Ensure Plus. Take a look at the ingredients. It's a baby milkshake or a Coca-Cola, either or. It's the same thing. So do you think that's a good idea to give to a cancer? Not so much. So in summary, sugar consumption correlates with obesity and cancer. Obesity is associated with cancer development, but metabolic syndrome due to insulin resistance is the reason. Fructose possesses unique metabolic characteristics that promote cellular damage the de novo lipogenesis, the liver fat, the Maillard reaction, and the reactive oxygen species with the cellular aging. Sugar is an independent risk factor for metabolic syndrome, and we have causation on that. It's exclusive of calories, it's exclusive of obesity, it is causation, causation. Meets the definition, the scientific and the legal definition for causation, and that is why there are now lawsuits that are succeeding against the food companies. Sugar may also be a risk factor for cancer development and promotion through these mechanisms I just described. And we currently consume triple our limit. It is driving these processes. And nutritional support for cancer provides high fructose content. You think that's a good idea? I don't think so. In fact, Memorial Sloan Kettering and MD Anderson are now conducting experiments with the ketogenic diet in patients with cancer to see if they, they will improve for this reason, and I am an advisor to both. So with that, I want to thank my collaborators at UCSF, at Berkeley, at Turo University, at San Francisco General, at University of Sydney, Kieran Rooney, whom should be known to this group already. And with that, I will close and answer questions at the Q&A. Thank you.